We're going to start talking about experience, and the, the guy who's coming up first, um, uh, yesterday you, you heard from Raul, and, uh, and uh, Phil said that Joe Garlington described Raul as the smartest man I know. I'm pretty sure that Raul would describe Joe Garlington as the smartest man he knows. Joe has had a, has, um, has just retired from Walt Disney Imagineering as the head of, as vice president of interactive design and inter interactive experiences. You'll have to get the title right for me. Um, but to call him retired is like calling Bill Clinton retired. He's busier now than he's ever been. And the, the day after he retired, he was in our office working on a whole new project with us. And he's, he's amazing. I've known him since before. He worked at Disney, he left Disney, started his own company, came back to Disney, wrote, built a whole organization that really was helping to create the, the entire science of interactive design as a real methodology and a way to create stuff. And he's been involved in some of the greatest projects you all know from the Disney parks, including a lot of things that Raul talked about. They partnered on, so, so Turtle Talk and Monsters, Inc. Laugh Floor and a lot of those interactive pieces. But he, he can tell you about some of those as he explains his take on this stuff. Um, but honestly, Joe is the smartest man I've ever met. And there is no conversation I have with him that I don't walk away from feeling uh, enlightened and amazed. And I hope he will do the same thing for you today. So please welcome the amazing Joe Garlington. So um, the first thing I have to point out is that there is something wrong with this sign. I was going to fix it with my handy dandy um, marker, but somebody got whiny about that. So um, <laughs> I have, a, I have a, a, a repair that I need to do here before we get underway, right? <laughs> um, because, because why sate, right? Why start with the damned S? Right, we've all agreed that story is this horrible word, right? Didn't we? I thought that's what came out of yesterday. And yet there it is, story is first thing on the, on the list. I don't think story should be first for a couple of reasons, two basic reasons. One is that um, story isn't really where you start, and two, everything shouldn't be about story. Um, can we bring the house lights up for just a second? I want to be able to see the audience. So I'm on, by show of hands, um, who here thinks that is a creative person when you start a project, you should start with by thinking about story? Show of hands. <laughs> I've made you all nervous, haven't I? If I? Before I put this up, all of you had gone like this, right? Okay, and then for everybody who's a working person, the college guys, I know some of your teachers may have cheated on this, so I'm not going to ask you to, but how many of you ever had an, uh, a boss come into your office and say, so we're starting this new project, and the first thing I need you to do is think of a new story? Yeah, liars. Um, <laughs> Because I've been in the business, <laughs> yeah, and the biggest liar right there. <laughs> I've been in the business almost 40 years, and I have led just a truckload of projects. There were some years when I had as many as 30 projects going at once, and I have never, ever had a, a, a boss come in and ask me that question. Because where, where you always start is with definition of a problem, right? It's always... The question is more like, we need a new attraction, we need a new look at a theme park, we need a new look at a land, uh, we're thinking about a new business. And even when your boss comes in with some sort of quasi-definition of, uh, of the project, it, it's not really worked out. And so the very first thing you do is spend a bunch of time trying to clarify your definition of the problem. And the second one is that play is as important as story. And half of what we ought to be doing, and I'm talking about not just theme parks, but museums and zoos and any place else you go that's themed entertainment, should be about play. And I'm going to talk more about that. Story first is a holdover from the film industry, right? That's where it came from. And if you um, talk to a, a filmmaker, they will naturally go there. It makes sense because the experience of story, uh, of filmmaking, has long since been understood. We all know what it's like to go to a theater. 
that was actually worked out before film because it was borrowed from legit stage, right? And so the, the whole experience of getting dressed up, going to the theater, sitting in the house, all that stuff was long worked out before. So when, this, when a filmmaker starts, they naturally start with story because all of the rest of that's assumed. But remember, movie makers don't have to invent the camera, the projector, <clears throat> the theater, the seating, any of that kind of stuff, and they don't have to train their audience in any way. Modern audiences understand flashbacks, zooms, you know, that a wavy screen means um, a flashback or dream sequence. Robert Coulter and Kevin Rafferty came up with the concept for Toy Story Midway Mania. And I'm sure that if you asked them uh, what came first, they'd tell you a story, because I'm sure that for them it did. But prior to that work, uh, all sorts of park operations staff, business people, uh, did a bunch of work first, right? I don't think it's any secret that when uh, Disney's California Adventure opened, it, initially it wasn't really well received and a whole lot of work had to be done. But the first thing they had to do was identify what parts were broken and what parts weren't because there was, Soren was there, um, Tower of Terror was there, California Screaming was there. Uh, there were a bunch of great attractions that worked really, really well. They had to identify first where was the problem, and then figure out how to that, do that. And, they had, and to figure that out, they had to understand what kind of experiences did, um, was the audience missing, right? They, uh, when the problem was given to WDI Creative Leadership, the first thing they didn't do was come to us with asking for questions about story. What they did was they came back and started a bunch of teams looking at a bunch of different experiences. There were entertainment teams looking at shows of various parts. There were ride teams working at rides, uh, concepts of various uh, sorts. Um, I had teams working on uh, interactive stuff and so forth. And that's just because that's the way it all works. Theme park guests think of the park as a buffet. Uh, and they want to sample as much stuff off that buffet table as they can. What they want is variety, a variety of experiences. Um, it's part of the promise that the institutions have long made to their guests. And if you can't deliver on that promise, you're going to disappoint them. If we just built a roller coaster, we're probably not going to build another roller coaster right now. Um, we're going to build something different. And a story may be what we come up with, but in the end, it's, uh, it's not going to be the most critical thing at the, at the start of the project. So. <laughs> At one point, <clears throat> I was asked to lead uh, uh, the energy pavilion, uh, a re rehab of the energy pavilion. Because remember, designers do kind of two works, they, it, kinds of work. They do greenfield work or they do rehabs. And frankly, if you get into the business, you can do probably way more uh, rehabs than you can do greenfield work. It just happens that way. So I was asked to start with the energy pavilion. But I was told I had to stick with the building. So clearly, architecture came before, right? And um, I was told I had to use the ride system and this projection system. So clearly, technology came first. Um, I was tori uh, told the story had to be about um, energy, because Exxon was the sponsor. So that meant marketing came before a story. You don't even have an M in SAIT, right? <laughs> and, um, and I was told that uh, whatever story I came up with, it had to have these dinosaurs in it because the dinosaurs were too popular to take out. So bottom line was architecture, technology, uh, marketing, and even old set work came before story. <laughs> <laughs> what I was told essentially was that I could do any story I wanted as long as it was about energy and had dinosaurs in act two. <laughs> okay. The Indiana Jones ride at, uh, uh, the original one was at Disneyland, started when John Snotty came up with the idea of a ride vehicle with a motion base on top. Then Tony Baxter came along and put a motion base on top of it. I mean a story on top of that. These designs all started with off-the-shelf equipment or bits and pieces of ro uh, roller coaster track that were uh, hooked together and then married to a theme. If there was story in these, it came way, way later. Right? These didn't start with story either. Museums start with an idea that a curator has. It starts with a, a piece of information they want to convey. They may end up using a story to convey it, but it doesn't start with story, it starts with the information. Same here. It starts with the animals that they own or can get, 
or it starts with the environments that they're trying to portray that animals come out of, right? Same here, it's about what they're trying to sell. Same here, it's about either the food or the dining experience, to use the word again. Right? But let me st stop you know, trashing story completely here because I have to do a little bit of a mea culpa. Probably 100% of what I've done has had story involved in it in some way or other. I love storytellers and I, lo and I love story generally. It's just that the reason that I care about this, that it isn't just an academic discussion, is that sometimes myth can get in the way of truth and dogma, and this is dogma, this story first thing, it's our theme park religion, can get in the way of actual production processes. Remember, we all work for business people first, and business people have their own set of agendas. And if they can't trust us to tell them accurately the story about how we work, how are, then we shouldn't be cranky with them when they direct us in directions that seem strange to us from a creative standpoint. We need to really be able to talk accurately about what we do. So let's talk about experience design a little bit more specifically and how it works, at least in my experience. An interviewer recently asked me if Toy Story Mania uh, is a ride or a game. It's a common question, and I know it may surprise you, but I've been asked it a whole bunch of times in my life. Seems like an odd question to me because the attraction's obviously both. You sit in a ride, you play a game, right? Um, when I first became an Imagineer sometime around 1980, Claude Coates, who was one of Walt Disney's original key designers, was working on a drive-through shooting gallery. Um, one didn't happen in a Disney park until Astro uh, Buzz Lightyear Astro Blasters came into being in 1980. Um, <clears throat> Robert Coltrane came up with that. Claude Coates never saw it. He'd already died in 1992. Um, it's been hugely successful, so is Men in Black, so is Toy Story Mania. Why did it take so long for these to come about? Why was it presumed that a ride contain a, can contain a story but shouldn't contain a game, right? And if it does, why is it felt that somehow or other it is either different or inferior? I've spent my whole career dealing with that crap, right? Guests don't have a problem with it. They have a great time with it. If you look at these attractions, these interactive attractions, um, I can't talk about Disney numbers officially, so we always use IAPA guesstimates of things, but if you take the IAPA guesstimates, interactive attractions punch well above their weight on a cost per, on a bang for buck, a cost per you know, guest rating of experience rating, they punch above their weight. They do better than traditional chosen rides, believe it or not. Um, and that's pretty much across the board uh, in not just Disney parks, but other parks around the world. Um, if you look at how the theme park industry is marketed these days, it's pretty quickly evident that ours is the last of the broadcast media. And by, what I mean by that is that we're the last group who try to entertain 8 to 80 men and women, boys and girls, all in the same breath, right? Nobody else does that anymore. Everything's become about niche marketing. Look at what ha what's happened to TV industry. Look at what's happened to the music industry. Look at what happened, you know, you know, to the internet, all of that. And yet, we're constantly told, uh, you know, my last project at Disney, the goal was still 8 to 80. Got to get everybody, right? Um, but it's changing. It's changing pretty rapidly. If you look at the success of, you know, Discovery Cove at SeaWorld or Sleep No More, in New York, those sorts of things that are more narrowly cast, they're doing great. And uh, my own feeling is that as the world gets bigger, each of us feels instinctively less and less enfranchised, just another cog in the machine, right? We're, The things that are catching are things like this, right? Facebook, Twitter, and so forth, um, that feel way more personalized. Remember that the word interactive is often code for personalization. Um, uh, sorry about this. So, sleep no more is Macbeth. 
can't get much more core story than Macbeth. It's been around since the 1600s, right? And yet, if you go talk to anybody who's seen Sleep No More and ask them what did they get out of it, they don't talk about Macbeth, they don't talk about the story. They talk about their experience, right? They talk about finding their way through that weird building, all of the discoveries, the surprises. My uh, young, uh, my 20-something son, you know, got uh, kissed by a naked actress, right? Um, it's hard to get more personalized than that and still be legal, right? <laughs> or more memorable, right? Um, Rawl and uh, John George's Chris Beatty and some others recently opened uh, you know, the Enchanted Tales with Bell experience. And it's fabulous. It is for a little kid kind of what Sleep No More was uh, for my son. Uh, getting hugged by Bell, getting to perform for her, to show off for her, is pretty much the same thing as my son getting kissed by a naked stranger. Um, <laughs> for, the, for those of you who don't know the show, you know, the kids come in, they do a performance of the, of the story of Beauty and the Beast, uh, directed by uh, an animatronic Lumiere and the purported audience being Belle. Though, of course, really the audience is everybody else. They're sort of performing for each other. Um, again, just like Sleep No More, they don't, ex they don't talk about this as, uh, as being about the story. They talk about the experience, about the experience of putting on a play you know, for this character that they just really love. And this did not start with story. This started with a simple observation that standing next to a character for a photograph is about the least interesting thing you can do with a princess. Right? So we spent a whole lot of time exploring different play patterns that we could engage in with uh, various princesses, constantly working for, looking for fun things to do. It goes to what I call the fundamentals. And I know that's corny, um, really corny. Um, but it, it comes down to a, a pretty simple thing, which is that um, in the end, it, it, you get to a fairly simple question, right? If, if I were to ask you which you'd what you'd rather do, see Luke Skywalker or be Luke Skywalker, which would you rather do, right? Be, right? For some adults, it's not necessarily that easy, but f clearly for kids, it's a hundred, you know, every, all of them are going to go for that, right? It's, um, it, for me, it's a, uh, yeah. For me, it's, it's a really simple thing, right? It, it comes down to a, a, a pretty simple formula. Being is better than seeing. And Admittedly, that there, there are going to be some parts of your audience, some, some adults, for, who, who don't believe that. And they don't believe it for a couple of reasons. Maybe they don't like to have to spend the energy, or maybe they are afraid of the performance. For most of them, I think it is that they are afraid that if they have to play a role, they're not going to be able to immerse themselves sufficiently to completely engage their willing suspension of disbelief. And that lack of a, an ability to, to engage like that is a problem for them. For kids, it's not a problem. They can engage in a heartbeat. And increasingly, for adults, that's true too. Right? Um, nobody knows where story or play came from, right? Both of them go back a really long time. But I think it's safe to say that story came after the invention of language because um, it's hard to tell a story if you can't talk. Um, if you remember uh, your high school biology class, animals are divided into categories in this order, can, uh, kingdom, phylum, class order, family, genus, species. Um, play is way older, way older than, um, than story. It is because it, it, uh, class was originally defined by physical characteristics. Birds have feathers, m mammals have hair, uh, you know, fish are cold-blooded, have uh, gills, that sort of stuff. But modern science knows that you could actually differentiate mammals from all other species. This is at the class level on a behavioral trait. Mammals play and no other species do, 
let me repeat that, mammals play and no other animals on the planet do. Um, and this is huge because what it talks about is that learning is our main thing. Animals are aware of their traits and their, their strengths, their weaknesses, and so forth. An elephant knows that its weight is a strength and a threat. A jaw, uh, shark's aware of the strength of its jaws. A spider knows it has venom. It has to know what its superhero trait is, if it's going to use it appropriately, if it knows when to bite or when to run away, right? Mammals know that our brains are our advantage, and humans know that knowledge is power. That's a really, really old phrase, right? A bird doesn't have that, right? Um, a swallow, if you take the egg out of a swallow nest and, ra and then incubate the egg and raise the chick, uh, where it never sees another nest of any kind in its life, when it reaches adulthood, it'll make a nest and it'll make a swallow nest. It can over, only ever make a swallow nest because the how-to of making a nest is coded at the genetic level. It can't learn to make a twig nest. It can't learn to hold its egg on its feet like a penguin, right? Even, it, it, but all us mammals do that stuff just sort of automatically. Um, what does that mean for us as designers? <clears throat> and how does this tie into anything? Um, if you go back 150 years, if you go back before Edison and all the inventions that happened at the beginning of the 20th century and look at how people entertained themselves, you'll find that about half of what they did reading a book, going to a play, that sort of stuff, was what we would now call storytelling. And about half of what they did, um, you know, riding with the hounds or playing poker or something like that, would be what we would now call play or game-based, right? It would be interactive. Um, the, the beginning of the 20th century brought about a kind of a funny thing, which was that uh, a bunch of people gave technology this huge kick in the pants. And so for the first 75 years of the 20th century, story was king. Radio, TV, film, all those things came along and made story seem just really, really sexy. And any play-based stuff was still non-technological, so looked kind of dorky. Walt Disney was you know, one of the inventors of that era. Uh, he was, he participated very much in all of that. And that's where this bias to film came from. Um, but I talked about learning just a second ago, and we need to understand how we learn because it impacts how we tell our stories and when we choose to do an attraction that's based on story versus an attraction based upon play. Um, now, I know I used the word learning, and that instantly put about half of you to sleep, but the reality is that learning is not that. Learning is that moment of joy I get when I've mastered something, right? When I've learned how to jump over a sprinkler or learned a new fact. What happens when a child learns something like that? They have to do it a million times over, in, uh, over and over again to prove their own mastery, and they have to tell you about it until they've driven you completely nuts because they're so proud of what they've done. And it doesn't matter whether it's a physical thing or a fact that they've learned. They've just got to do it. There's a ton of joy in that. Um, what we're learning about more often than not is tough stuff. Um, it's not how to do math or chemistry or anything like that. What we're learning is the real lessons of life. There's little kid stuff like how to talk, how to walk, how to throw, how to catch, all that stuff. But there's a lot of social stuff that we learn and that we have to experiment on all the time. Most of us spend most of our lives learning, even when we think we're not. We're learning how to negotiate with each other, how to find a mate, how to you know, get a job, how to keep a job, how to deal with coworkers. There's just a ton of learning. And we don't realize often that we're doing it. Um, if you take these shows here and ask even most of the people who are making them, they'll tell you these are escapist entertainment. They are not. They're all serious. If you read these, these are the official lines that come from these things. Every one of them is, t is about a serious subject that people ta have to tackle in their lives every day, right? These, we use humor, we use adventure, we use those th sorts of things as a way to make these subjects approachable. But this is all serious entertainment. Same with movies, right? Same with you know, 
pr police procedurals. They, they help us understand the underlying value of what it's like uh, of what it's like to be human. They help us learn about ways we can deal with tough situations that are similar to the ones that are shown here. Um, we can learn by three ways. You can learn by doing. Uh, the problem is if I am a seven-year-old kid in a jungle society and I take my dad's spear out into the forest to get dinner and I do so without any training, I'm as likely to be eaten as eat. Um, so what we generally do is learn by two safer ways, learn by example, or learn by an abstracted experience. Learn by example is the heart of storytelling, learn by experience is the heart of game playing. And they both go back so far that they can, you know, there's evidence of them in hieroglyphics from, the, from Egypt and they go back beyond that, right? They are very, very fundamental things. And if we talk about the how people entertain themselves before Edison fucked it all up, um, you realize that both of those are there and they, they have to be there because we learn differently for different experiences or for different reasons, right? Um, stories work best because they teach us things that we couldn't generally find out on our own. We see things uh, uh, put up in a way that we might not, occur, uh, might not occur, problem solved in ways that we might uh, not think of, it might not occur to us about. We um, are shown the value of something that we may not weight properly. Um, uh, it'll, it's, a, it's an easy way for someone to uh, understand, you know, for one person to learn something and pass that information along without uh, somebody having to live it the second time. Um, they're great for, for things like learning about love, for instance. 80% of all songs are about love. Love is this huge component in um, movies and books and stuff like that, right? Because it's a, it's a hard thing to practice, right? Somebody who practices a lot of love uh, is generally considered to have missed the boat, right? They don't, they're not getting the fundamental there. Um, play is better because it's often more multi-sensory, it's more memorable. I can tell my son a hundred stories, horror stories about why not to touch the hot stove. All he has to do is touch it once and he's got it. And there's certain things you simply can't learn without play, right? Without repeat, repetition. Almost nobody outside the military reads about military strategy and tactics, right? And yet there are periods in their lives when pretty much 100% of all small boys play uh, repeatedly with that stuff. Um, as designers, we need to remember two things, right? That <clears throat> stories and play exist to meet different needs, and they are differentiated by who controls the protagonist, because that's the other half of it, right? That in a story, the author is responsible, uh, responsible for the actions of the protagonist, but in a game, in play, the user is responsible. And the game industry is working really, really hard right now to find a way to fuse those things, and in a lot of longer play uh, games, they do a very nice job of it. But um, in our environments, which are generally short play, because of this buffet idea, and everybody, nobody will give anything a really long period of attention in a park, you need to be aware of what you're asking your guests to do, right? Are you, is your goal to tell them a story, to show them something, or is your goal to let them discover something on their own? And, and, and it's, a, it's a critical difference and, and, and one where I think as an industry we tend to fall, fall down a lot, right? Play is this wonderful thing and we, we just don't give it enough, enough play in, in the parks, in the museums, or any of those place, places. And it doesn't have to be complex stuff, right? The mechanics, the play patterns that uh, we use often want to be real simple, right? They want to be basic thing. At its heart, Turtle Talk with Crush is a puppet show, right? It's just got a really, really cool puppet. Uh, Bell, the sh Bell Show is role playing which kids have been doing as long as there have been kids, but in this really special place where we have special permissions to um, be silly, make, make fools for ourselves. And in a funny way, it, this is exactly where people like Walt originally wanted to go, right? Um, in, the, in the days when he started, one of the reasons he built the park was because he noticed his, his audiences were really interested, uh, 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 excuse me, his friends, when he would take them 
to his, the backstage on the lot where he had made his films and stuff, the audiences loved being put into these places um, that were of different times and so forth. It was one of the impetuses behind Disneyland. Um, he wanted to, he talked about wanting to put his guests into the hearts of his stories, but the technology at the time only allowed him to put them there physically. And so that's what the parks generally are. But nowadays we have much better tools. We can do more than that. It's not like Walt didn't try. He wanted his guests to feel like Indians when they paddled the canoes, right? He wanted you to feel like Tom Sawyer when you were on Tom Sawyer's Island. Like I say, role playing's been around forever. Why wouldn't he want that? It's, it's just a basic thing. Most people think of role playing like this. Um, and it doesn't have to be that. Um, last year, I believe Asa Kalama gave a role, a, a talk here, and, I, and Corey's going to follow later, talking about some of the experiments they did at Disney R&D. But one of the key takeaways he noted was that a lot of people who said they didn't want to play, because you get a lot of that, um, really loved it once they got into it. One of the constant pushbacks that people like me get when you try to propose an interactive attraction in the park is that no, 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 people don't want to, they don't want to do that. They, they just want to sit down and be entertained. And I'm not going to argue that there, aren't, there, isn't an argue, there isn't an audience for that. There's a lot of people who just want to sit and be entertained. But this fact that people really do enjoy playing when, when, once they get over that initial bit of business is really buttressed strongly by the, by the experience of people who run games, right? Almost every major city in, in the world now has regular games that you can sign up for that go out and play that are role-playing games. Um, to me, I think the, the issue is actually slightly different, that it is a fear of the new more than a fear of the play. When I was uh, growing up, when I was the age of most of you students, um, Pong had just been invented. And everybody I knew you know, went with this axiom that you couldn't teach an old dog new tricks and nobody, but nobody, was going to play a game, right? And so nobody made any attempt to get them to do that. People just, it, it was axiomatic that old people were not going to play games that young people were. Well, the world has changed a lot in 30 years, right? The, um, the statistics are, for games are huge. Game revenues this year will be about 20 times movie revenues, right? Young people have come on, embraced technology in this crazy, crazy way. Everything's interactive everywhere. And that fear has gone away, largely because the old people died off. So especially for the students here, going to be working in the industry for the next 30 years, they're going to be dealing with an audience that is very, very comfortable and familiar with play and interactivity. And role playing, which seems dorky and geeky and intimidating to people my age, is not nearly so intimidating to anybody else. Um, I, you know, it's a new game mechanics invented every year, every five years, and mechanic comes along that is so persu persuasive that it becomes a whole new industry. Uh, I'm not saying audiences still don't like stories. They do. They remain the most efficient way of communicating certain messages. But our industry needs to understand and catch up to the fact that they need to rebalance the parks, the museums, the zoos, all this stuff. You need a lot more play. Um, at any rate, that's, uh, that's, that's my, my message. Thanks for letting me rant. I don't know if we have time for any questions. Do we? Yes? No? Five minutes, okay. Any questions or anything? Hey, um, uh, this is David. I was just wondering um, if you feel that experience is maybe a part of storytelling. Because from the first day when, when, when um, you know, we were de defining storytelling, talked about how the, uh, the premise plus the theme equal the, equal the promise. Oh, you listened to him? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering how you think those definitions relate to the experience. I would flip it. I believe that story is a subset of experience. Story is one of the kinds of experiences you can have. But there's a whole bunch of play-based stuff that's also a subset of experience. <laughs> uh, there's somebody in the very back there. Uh, 
Hi, Joe. Um, as a game designer who's really interested in converging both games and theme entertainment, how flexible you see this industry being in sort of accepting that? Because it's, there's a lot of infrastructure and capital sort of spent in, in very rigid sort of structures. Um, do you see this happening very soon, or is it going to happen later? I, I can tell you how to figure it out. Um, years ago, I was at Bell Labs when Bell Labs still existed, and um, uh, we were at that, their big R&D group, and I asked them, how long does it take to get a product from uh, idea to field? And they said, well, it depends on whether it's evolution or revolution. They said, an evolutionary idea takes about eight years. A revolutionary idea, the, these were all PhD scientist guys, right? They kind of looked around the room awkwardly at each other, and finally one of them said, you kind of have to let the old management die off. And uh, I would say that that's probably true here too, <laughs> okay? So the easiest way to figure it out is to look at the age of the management of the various companies that you're talking about. <laughs> it's grim, what can I say? <laughs> that's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to. Hey, Joe. Uh, Daniel Gomez, first person experience. Um, mm -hmm. The question I have is, uh, with regards to experience, do you find that people find uh, and experiences that, they, that are related to IPs, um, uh, that they have more fun playing with those experiences, such as being Luke Skywalker versus a brand new type of, of like, no-name experience, such as uh, Sleep No More. People don't even, most people don't even know Macbeth anymore but they still have that, that awe-inspiring feeling when they go into something like that. I, is there a difference or is there yeah, a... Yeah, I don't, there? but I don't know. Uh, the reason IP is used so much in uh, parks is because it, everybody knows, everybody who designs theme parks knows they're just about the world's worst place to tell a story, right? You're distracted, you don't have much time. Uh, Raul mentioned that I, you know, there's the joke that the audience loses 50 points off their IQ um, when they walk through the gate. And it's true because it is such a uh, distracting environment. When I'm sitting at home watching a movie, 99.9% .9 of my brain is devoted to that movie because we know the way the brain works. It tunes out the normal. It just, you know, we've all driven to work in the morning and arrived and just negotiated three hairy, scary parts of our route and, and don't remember doing it. It's, you know, how we drive is crazy. But, um, so IP, a familiar IP means it's easier for us to understand the beats of the story. When I go through, I originally had in this talk uh, Snow White at Disneyland as an example, which is, if you didn't know that story going in, you'd never get it from riding the ride. But, because everybody knows the story, then sitting in those environments and feeling them around you is great. Well, on the interactive side, you have the same issue. You want people to come in with play patterns that are familiar to themselves. So if you're designing a theme park game, find, find one that's really broadly understood and base your, base your game on that, not on something esoteric. And whether that's attached to an IP, uh, less important, I think. One minute, okay. One last question, or are we? I have a question. With the mic. Over here. <laughs> so regarding play, how, what are your thoughts on play and using that in an educational sense, like in the classroom, or even museums, but mostly the classroom? Uh, again, I think that you learn a lot of things more deeply if your own discovery is part of it. I'm more interested in things that I choose to pursue than I am things that you might want me to pursue. Right? So I think play is a huge thing. That's it? You're going out on that joke? That's it. Good yeah. <laughs> that was, that, that's the end of it, yes. <laughs> it was awesome. Guys, thank you. Please thank uh, the smartest man we know. Not, not true, but thank you. Oh,